page 19, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. Good to see you in Sunday school this morning. It's good to be back home. I'm a little disappointed that you all survived without me. Um, I thought that I was more necessary, but uh, apparently Kendall got done five minutes early in the morning and the evening. So I'm going to go five minutes over tonight to make up for that. Just uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, page 19 in your chorus book. I will sing of the mercies. Let's sing together. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing. I will sing. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. seated. Amen. Amen. Anybody have a birthday this last week? Anybody we can embarrass at this time? No? She hasn't been in church? Well, she's not here now. Oh, there she is. Okay, we'll catch her. Anybody have an anniversary this last week? Okay. Okay, Bud and Sam had an anniversary. Let's sing happy anniversary to Bud and Sam. Ready? Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. by their facial expressions. I don't know if they're enjoying it. I'm not so I'm not so sure. And Ashley, we did not sing happy birthday to you yet. Well, we're going to sing. We're, you're going to get another one. You ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy Uh, Brother Kendall, come. Uh, we just got a lot to be praying for for our church family. Uh, it's going to be a big week. We've got uh, Rose's uh, funeral on Tuesday, and then uh, Sam's mother's on Friday, Friday, and uh, just a lot to be praying about. Katie, just an update on Katie is that she, uh, if you didn't get the message, uh, she's got 60% uh, brain loss from uh, massive stroke, and then she's had other things going on, and and it's just a decision on how this, you know, unless God directly intervenes uh, to change things, it's just how does how we're going to finish this. And um, I talked to Matt last night, you know, and he he's bewildered. He's a little a little bewildered about stuff, and. Uh, let's make sure that we're praying for him as these decisions keep coming back on him. He was going to go home for a, a, a day or two. The, the one, one of the doctors said, just go ahead and go home. He got home, started getting phone calls, turned around, went right back last night. So that's where he is. And uh, so, Isaac, we're praying for you all. It's a tough time. It's a tough time. Um, uh, thank you for your graciousness uh, as far as Abigail's circumstances go. Um, you, you don't have to walk on eggshells, okay? You really don't. Uh, I noticed many of you were, were sort of like like this this morning and uh, not knowing what to say. Um, 
we're going to get Abigail and the kids back here as soon as we can. They just need to tie up some loose ends there. It's going to take a few weeks. And Abigail, uh, Emma has, she's in a, in the uh, K-4 there at, at Harvest, and their graduation is May 24th. So we're going to be taking another trip to Iowa because Papa and Nana have to be there. And, uh, and Lord willing, maybe we'll be bringing the kids back with us. We'll just see how that works. And so I appreciate your prayers. Brother Kendall. All right. Let's go ahead and get out our hymnal here this morning. And we're going to find a song to sing. I, I should start picking songs out before Sunday school. That would be a, a really great idea. Let's turn to page 553 this morning. 553, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. I just want to say it's good to have Mrs. Crone again. She came last week because she heard I was preaching, and she came this week because she thought I was preaching again. But um, <clears throat> anyway, just getting that out of the way. <clears throat> All right, let's stand together and sing 553, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise mine Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to seated. All right, let's go ahead and uh, take some prayer requests this morning and ask Brother Kevin to write these down once again. And then we'll take those before the Lord this morning. Any prayer requests here this morning? Yes, ma'am. Wonderful. Wonderful. Praise the Lord for, for that. Yes, ma'am. Amen. All right. Second round coming June 1st. All right. So everybody back away from Roseanne, okay? <laughs> That's where the coats are. That's the problem. <laughs> anyway, it's with the people. All right. Yes. Mm-hmm. 
Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Yep. I'm sorry, Amy. Tommy is not here this morning. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, I uh, pray that uh, the Lord will work through the funerals this week. And uh, I'm sure would love to see some people come to Christ as a result, right? And certainly the Holy Spirit will be working on some people. So, look, at God's already working. Josh came all the way to the second row. <laughs> Oh, he's going back. All right, never mind. It was <laughs> now Amy's coming. This is happening, folks. Somebody come play the piano. Revival's breaking out. <clears throat> anyway, uh, they're all praying that Pastor would get out five minutes early because it was great last week. I'm telling you what. Anyway, moving right along. All right. Yeah, well, you know. Some people can say an awful lot more in a lot less time, that's all. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Amen. All right. <laughs> My parents learned that one on their vehicle this week, too. <laughs> I don't know if you heard the story there, but, uh, but Mom was coming back from Iowa Friday, Thursday, Thursday, driving back. She got to Bettendorf, Iowa, which I think you were planning on stopping there went to stop and like all the dash lights came on. And so I called a mechanic buddy of mine and said, obviously this is a problem, what's going on here? He said, it could be something as simple as a sensor. It could be that the wheel bearing is really bad. He said, so have her get it checked before she goes anywhere. Well, any of you ladies know how much you just love being alone and going to a strange shop, right? And so, anyway, the Lord led us to some incredible people down there that we were able to help her out, and they took a look and said, that wheel's about to fall off. So we're praising the Lord for uh, safety for her and uh, for a friend who's a mechanic and for new friends who are mechanics, too. They sure were a blessing. And uh, all right, and if you would be praying for Ashley, she's going to be driving down to Pennsylvania tomorrow to, uh, Lord will, and bring the kids back. And uh, she'll be there a couple days and coming back. So, right as she travels. Anybody else this morning? I don't want to miss anybody. Ashley. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Good, good results for my mother in law's tests there. Amy. Um, I hmm. Mm, all right. Now, is that, is she the one that I, did I do her husband's funeral? Okay. I thought so. All right. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Amen. Amen. So just keep praying for those funerals. Of course, let's keep praying for Katie. And uh, that was already mentioned, but we'll mention her again. And for Matt and Isaac, um, just be praying that God gives Matt some very clear um, discernment and uh, that he would give him comfort with the decisions he needs to make. You know, those decisions, you don't feel good about any of them. That's the hard part. There, there really is not a winning decision that everybody just feels good about. And so what he's going to need is an awful lot of support from his family here and a lot of prayer. And uh, thank God that the Holy Spirit gives a lot of comfort and a lot of grace. And so um, you all just be praying for him. If you've ever been in that situation to have to make one of those decisions, 
you don't want you don't want to see anybody. <laughs> you don't want to talk to anybody because you're a lot, a lot of times afraid of what everybody else is going to think, and that's a that's a hard place to be. So we're praying for Matt and the family. All right. Let's do this, and Brother Kevin, why don't you come up and open us in prayer, and then we'll get into our Bible study this morning. Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day, and each and everyone that could make it out, and just continue to watch over those on the way, and we do pray just bringing these... Uh, Praises before you. We thank you for those, first of all, dear Lord. Uh, heard a few of them today, and that's always a good thing. But our church family's been hurt, and a lot of things going on this week. And just praying for the Govitz family, uh, Dan and and Dan and Josh and the Ramirez family, and just uh, just be with each and every one, dear Lord. Uh, just continue to watch over just uh, all the things that go on with that. Be with Josh as. He's asking for boldness and just uh, be with the whole situation there, dear Lord. Just know it can be to your glory and just uh, happy for her home going because we know she's in a much better place, but we know it uh, hurts the family. And we do pray, uh, too, for the Salmon family. Uh, no no one goes here, but just uh, need to remember them. And, and then remember Katie, just uh, all the situations going on there. And Matt, the decisions he has to make. Uh, coming up and uh, there are no easy decisions there and just uh, be with Matt and just give him all the, the help he can get and just uh, be with Isaac watch over over them and just uh, just give them all unity and decisions that have to be made and just uh, Sam's family is uh, they're going to be having a funeral coming up for her ma just be with, be with them and all the needs there and just uh all the needs that hearts uh, just would be touched at these funerals. Uh, we know you're in charge, dear Lord, and you know the needs in each and every family, and just uh, continue to watch over all that goes on there. And we do pray for Abigail and the kids and just that situation, dear Lord. You know everything going on there, and so just leave that in your hands. And uh, Roseanne having the chemo and ongoing chemo, just uh, watch over her and protect her from any uh, germs or anything, because we know that kind of takes you down. And uh, Ashley, as she's going to be traveling, just give her traveling mercies and watch over uh, her as she goes out Pennsylvania and give her a good trip out there and back. And just uh, we would remember uh, Amy's Aunt Maxine. She's in hospice now and uh, uh, just a matter of time with that. And just uh, continue to watch over our church here and all the issues, our church family, and just uh, just keep us unified and all going in the same direction and just uh, all the programs going forward, dear Lord, and just be with uh, Kendall as he brings the lesson this morning, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kevin. And before I forget, I want to mention this as well, uh, that Brother Jim Peters just mentioned to me this morning, he is uh, going to be... Uh, unavailable for much of the summer. Uh, this is uh, obviously for him, this is sort of a busy time of the year. Uh, he is an engineer for DTE, if you didn't know that, and so there's a lot that he has going on. He's going to be unavailable for much of the summer uh, to drive the bus, and so we're going to need some uh, at, at least one person, obviously, but um, if there were a couple people that we could maybe put together a schedule for driving the bus, or if you're interested in helping, put it that way, if you're interested in helping, it requires no special um, uh, certifications or endorsements or, or licensing or anything. It's uh, classified as a 15-passenger van. So uh, if you are interested in helping with that, if you want to just come talk to me at some point, um, here in the next few weeks, that would be great, and we'll get that figured out. Yes, ma'am. Does it doesn't matter. Uh, I believe that Brother Jim Rose, he's he's been going with Jim uh, Peters uh, on Sunday mornings, and I think he'd be available to help out and things as well. Uh, but if you are interested, there's a few things to go over. Honestly, some some kind of idiosyncrasies with the vehicle, as well as uh, how, how some of the things operate on there. So um, 
Anyway, Galatians chapter 5 this morning. Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to continue in our study here of the book of Galatians. And uh, I, I wanted to say this, I, um, in, in honor of their anniversary, I sent Bud something very nice last night. I didn't get it put up on the screen, otherwise I should have. But anyway, it's a man hold, by the street holding a cardboard sign that says, I need money. I'm not homeless, but my wife makes quilts. So... Uh, I will talk later. Okay. Anyway, you need money. Is that it? Uh, it's not Bud that needs money. You need the money. All right. I'll, we'll, the pastor does counseling on Thursdays. And anyway, Galatians chapter five, and we're looking at liberty to love, liberty to love. Let's go ahead and read the first six verses once again. We've done this uh, several times now. We're slowly making our way through this, but I, I want to get as much out of this as we possibly can, so we're not in a hurry to get through these lessons. Uh, but starting at uh, chapter 5 and verse 1, the Bible says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. Ye are fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith." And we're going to go through verse 6. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. And of course, uh, for those that haven't been in here in the last little bit, we'll bring you up to speed a little bit here at least. And uh, uh, there, what we're looking at here in chapter 5 of the book of Galatians is where uh, there's a turning point here from Paul really pushing a lot of doctrinal truth about the doctrine of grace and how grace uh, doesn't just save us, grace sanctifies us and grace is doing a continual work in our lives and uh, uh, y'all are going to throw me off if you're sitting on that side, okay? This is, uh, <laughs> uh, but y'all know as Baptists we have our places, this is where we sit and nobody else sits and then when somebody moves it really warps the brain up here, but Anyway, good to have you this morning. Uh, but, but what Paul's doing is he's transitioning from teaching an awful lot of doctrine to now applying it to the current situation at the church in Galatia. The situation was that the Judaizers were coming in and distorting the truth. Paul had started by saying, test the truth, because these people that profess themselves to be teachers and to be, uh, be, be people that are teaching the gospel, they aren't necessarily always teaching the right gospel. So you need to test it against other scripture, against the other things that you've been taught by the apostles. You need to test those things to make sure they're true. The reason you need to test them is because these people are telling you that you don't need grace anymore for your Christian life. You need to adhere to the Jewish law. You need to go back to the Old Testament law and now that you're saved, now that you're born again, and this is now how you're supposed to live your life according to Jewish tradition and law. That's what they're trying to tell you, Paul's telling them. He's saying this is what they're trying to push, but you, you are not under the law, you're under grace. Why would you go back under the, 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 the schoolmaster, that's the term he used, the schoolmaster and the bondage of the law that was only there to show you that you needed grace in the first place? Why would you put yourself back under that now for perfecting you? He said it wasn't powerful enough to save you. How is it now going to make you holy? You still need grace. And what he's saying now in chapter 5 is he's applying this whole thing saying because of this, because of the doctrine of grace that we've just promoted to you and just pushed with you and just explained, he said, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ, Christ hath made us free. Stand fast. Don't let go of that position that you now have in Christ. We, you, you have been given grace. So stay, stay in it. And the reason for this command was because for a lot of them, persecution may be tempting them or us to give up our liberty. Our liberty that we have in grace. Persecution is a pretty big, it's pretty persuasive. 
And that's what he's concerned about here. And also saying so that they don't lose the blessing of living by faith. Living by faith is a blessing. Is it hard? Sure. Is living under the law hard? Pick your hard, I guess. One of them promises liberty. One of them guarantees bondage. Pick which hard life you want to live. I, I personally prefer liberty. <laughs> and that's what Paul's telling them. The parts of the command were a very positive part. Stand fast. You can do this. He's saying just hold on to it. Stay put. Stand fast in that liberty that you've been given. The phrase means to plant one's feet solidly with determination not to move. I shall not, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the water, right? I shall not be moved, says every toddler who's sitting in front of a cartoon and now it's time to go to church, right? Anyway. And here in Galatians 5, we're told to stand just as firm on our liberty in Christ as we are, uh, as Paul, Paul tells people once again, and he tells the, the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 6 to stand fast against the wiles of the devil. He's saying, and what he's telling you is, yeah, you're going to find freedom and liberty in this life under grace and in this uh, Christian life. You're going to find that liberty, but it will be a struggle. There is a battle going on for you and to put you back in bondage. So stand fast. This is a warfare term to stand your ground. And then the negative part of this was he's saying, don't return to slavery. Don't return. Why would you go back? Why would you choose slavery over freedom? Why would you choose bondage over liberty? He's saying, don't go back. What does he say there? Uh, Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Don't go back to that. Don't go back and put yourself back under the law. What good is it going to do you? And so uh, we contrasted, then started this last week, contrasting liberty and bondage. We have left behind the yoke of sin and obligation in favor of the yoke of Christ, and he said that that one is easy and his burden is light compared to the law. I mean, you live a pretty paranoid life if you're going to live under the law, making sure that every single thing you do is just perfect. Why? Because it all relies on you. And how many of us would say, yeah, I think I could do that? Not a one of us, I don't think could say, oh, sure, I could live under the law. Well, see, the problem is we already messed it up. So you, you, you can't. You can't do enough good to outweigh the bad, right? If you could, and this is where Paul later on is saying that you've made Christ of none effect. If you can be justified by the law, or if you can be sanctified by the law, then you've made Christ of no effect. The crucifixion and suffering of Christ and the resurrection of Christ and the power and grace that Christ brought is made of no effect. We liken that last week to uh, a soldier getting out of a, a tank and boy, he's got this big tank with this great big gun. You talk about some power. And he jumps out of that tank and goes, grabs his little water pistol and says, no, I'm going to do this on my own. Good luck. You've you've totally abandoned the power that you have by grace, the position that you've been put in, and now you're going to try to do it on your own? It sounds ridiculous, because it is. And that's what Paul's trying to show the people here in the book of Galatians, is he goes, why would you do this to yourself? It makes no sense. Contrasting liberty and bondage we see this first we see law living let's look at two different lives here contrast of two lives this is the rest of the verse we spent a lot of time on verse one now we're going to look at verses two through six that we already read first one we're going to see is law living the first of these two lives 
We recall that the Galatians had been saved under Paul's ministry, but the Judaizers, the false teachers, had entered into the church, teaching people that they should live the Christian life in their own strength, which is what the law teaches. The law says if you're going to be justified by the law, you're going to have to do it on your own. That has nothing to do with God working through you. That's all on you. And good luck. It's an impossible system. It's a system that was put in place to show mankind their absolute need for grace. That was what the law was intended for. The law was never intended to save anybody, but to show us our need for God's grace. And these Judaizers were trying to tell them that now that you're saved, yeah, you got saved by grace, but now you need to get back under that system in order to live right. And it's all on you. And it's your performance that counts when it comes to your standing with Christ. Most of the Judaizers agreed that salvation came only through faith in Christ, but they taught that spiritual growth could only come through hard effort and self-righteousness. And in their minds, Christians were still bound to the law. Now, why would they do that? Well, number one, they had been taught wrong, obviously. And what we're doing here is we're putting a whole lot of mankind's reasoning and our own thoughts on how we think a Christian ought to act and how ought to live versus what the Bible says and what the Holy Spirit says and what grace says. But here's another element of that. If you think about it this way, the Judaizers were still looking for an element of control within the church. You can control people when you can say, you know, you're really not doing good enough. That sounds like some denominations today. Okay? That are saying, you need to do thus and so in order to have a place with Christ. They're saying that you've got to go through all of these steps in order to have some kind of growth in your Christian life. And if you don't do good enough, this, it, gives, it gives those religious leaders control. That law, that law included uh, the command that God gave Abraham to mark his descendants as God's chosen people through the avenue of circumcision. Circumcision served as the first and foremost among all Jewish traditions, And it made sense that that would be the practice that the Judaizers held as most important because this was really the first thing that God used to distinguish his people from others. And what Paul is saying here, if you look in verse 2, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify, let's keep reading in the context, because if you stop right there, it really kind of throws some... You can get a lot of false doctrine from that verse. Let's keep going to verse 3. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Notice that he is speaking to born-again Christians, and this idea of being fallen from grace is not dealing with losing your salvation No, it's stepping out of the position that Christ has given you under grace to live a holy Christian life. And when you choose to put yourself back under the law, back under bondage, then that is a choice to step away from the grace that he's extending. That's why he's saying you're fallen from grace. Paul argues here that circumcision has no profit for a Christian. The Holy Spirit marks us. As God's children, why do we need a physical identifier? So the ritual means nothing in Christ. Last week we also mentioned this, that bondage to one ritual is bondage to the whole law. Either you're under the law or you're not. Either you are living under grace all the way or you're not. You can't pick and choose what parts of the Christian life you want to do by yourself and what part you want to do under grace. Either 
you are living by faith through grace, by grace through faith rather. Either you're living by grace through faith or you're living on your own. And if you choose to go it on your own, you know what God's going to do? You know what Jesus is going to do? Okay. I'll be right here. When you realize it doesn't work, when you hit that brick wall a few times and realize there's no way you can do it on your own. See, when you came to Christ, you admitted that you could not justify yourself on your own. You could not be justified on your own. You accepted the fact that you needed grace. Why would anyone at that point say, okay, now that we got that out of the way, I can do this on my own now? Really? The same grace you needed to get saved is the same grace you need if you're going to be a holy individual. The same grace that got you saved is the same grace you need to be sanctified. And God's going to continue to do a work on you. But what's great is that's all on Him. And He's going to do things. You can't make it happen. Don't you wish you could just make yourself, snap your fingers and, yep, I, I'm going to be holy today. I wish, but it's a work of grace. That work of grace is a moment-by-moment -moment thing, Brother Joe. <clears throat> Absolutely. Well, I'll tell you what, when, when you say, I can do this on my own today, I don't need grace in this situation. For Satan, he's shooting fish in a barrel. This is, this is easy pickings. Because you're so far removed now from your protection under grace, and your humi which is humility, <laughs> you're so full of pride, and the devil can make anything look good when you're full of pride and seem good and you can justify it you can work through it you can word things in such a way that boy it makes it sound like you're doing so good but you don't have god fooled you only have yourself fooled you don't e we don't even fool ourselves do we really we make ourselves believe that we're good on our own yeah, pretty much, pretty much. And if you don't know any different, ask your spouse. Ask your kids or grandkids. Ask those people that are close to you. Am I really that? Listen, if you've got to ask if you're that full of pride, I mean, come on. That's a pretty prideful question, isn't it? Anyway, we'll move on. That one is not getting a whole lot of backing there all right bondage to one ritual is bondage to the whole law what he's saying here is if you're going to put yourself if you're going to require that new christians start following the law in this area or that listen you've got to follow the whole thing you cannot piecemeal the law either you're under the law or you're not and then he says this that in bondage grace becomes useless becomes useless Finally, when we live under the law, grace becomes useless to us. We no longer take advantage of God's goodness. When Paul writes in this verse that we can fall from grace, once again, he's not meaning that we can lose our salvation because he's obviously writing to Christians. But instead, he's meaning here that we reject the blessings of grace when we depend on ourselves. We reje reject the blessings of grace. We deny ourselves the benefit of perhaps the greatest treasure on earth. And that is God's favor with all the love, grace, and spirit-enabled strength that comes with it. Does God still love you? Of course He does. He's still standing there with grace as soon as you want it. He's not going to make you... <laughs> well, this is... God doesn't make you work for grace. 
right, then it wouldn't be grace. He's not going to make you work your way back to it. No. The moment you're ready to say, okay, yeah, I, I can't do this on my own. What was I thinking? God, I'm sorry. And God's standing right there with sufficient grace for what you need for whatever that situation is. He's ready. We deny ourselves that benefit of God's grace. Before salvation, we were falling apart, jars of clay with blemishes and cracks, far too fragile to be used. But when God redeemed us, He placed His Spirit inside of us, and suddenly these jars of clay have the glory and power of God living in them and through them, and now amazing things can happen. We become vessels of His grace and love, and we get the chance to share that with others. You see, church, as the Holy Spirit fills us with His grace and His love, the idea is not that it, He would fill you and you get to now hoard that to yourself and just live a happy life full of God's grace. Now, the idea is He's going to fill you to overflowing so that you can be spilling out that grace and that love to a lost and dying world around you, to hurting brothers and sisters in Christ around you. Hey, listen, this is what we're going to do uh, here on Tuesday and on Friday. As a church, we're going to come together and we're going to share some grace for a while. That's, that's the comfort that comes from being in the family of Christ. Is that we... Listen, yeah, His grace is sufficient for me for right now, but you know what that means? Since His grace is sufficient for me, I can go down to Ann Arbor and spend some time with Isaac and Matt and family and Katie and, and share that with them a little bit too. Because He's filled me with it. And I can come on Tuesday and I can spend some time with Brother Josh or Miss Sue or Brother David or whoever else in the family and be a blessing to them. That's part of being filled with God's grace. When we obscure God's grace within us, it's basically rather, rather than them seeing the amazing thing that has filled us, we're just trying to impress them with a jar of clay. I've heard one preacher say this, we're all just a bunch of dirt pots. I'm a dirt pot, you're a dirt pot. Some of us have better paint on our dirt pots, but ultimately we're all just a bunch of dirt pots has nothing to do with what's on the exterior of the dirt pot. It's all about what's inside the dirt pot. And if we're trying to hide that in what we can do, we're hiding that in something that's only superficial and really has no merit or value in and of its own. No, it's what's inside of it that gives it its value. When we try to impress others with our jars of clay and not the power within, we'll only show how weak and fragile we are on our own. We can't even accomplish what we set out to do. <laughs> and that's what happens when we try to live under the law. But then there's faith living. Faith living. Verse 5 and 6, For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Instead, we must live by faith. These verses summarize what a grace-filled, faith-filled life looks like. First of all, what does he say there in verse 5? For we through ourselves. No. No. For we, in and of our own strength and our own ability. No. For we, because we have kept the law. No. He says, for we, through the Spirit. It's through the Spirit. It's all His working. It's empowered by the Spirit. This faith-filled life, faith-living is empowered by the Spirit. We live empowered by the Spirit of God. Christians live in a pretty weird situation because on one hand, we live in this world. We, we, and we don't like what we see, do we? No. 
we, but we live in this world. And Scripture tells us that we're not citizens of this world. Even though we're here, this isn't our citizenship. We're like foreign travelers on our way to another destination. We don't quite fit in. Listen, if the world is, if you fit in with the world around you, you may want to check how spirit-filled you are. You may want to check your relationship with the Lord. I'm not saying you're not a Christian, but are you living a grace-filled, spirit-filled life? Leonard Ravenhill used to put it this way. He said, how is it that the world can get along or couldn't get along with the holiest man that ever lived, but it can get along with you and me? Then he says, are we compromised? Have we no spiritual stature? Have we no righteousness that reflects on their corruption? I didn't say that. Leonard Ravenhill did. Okay. This is how we live a Christian life. Listen, if you live a Holy Spirit-filled, grace-filled, Spirit-led Christian life, you will look different than the world around you. That's why Paul's saying we don't need the physical markers here. There's enough of a spiritual difference. There should be enough of a spiritual difference between the Christian and the world that the world can say there's something different about that person. That we don't need a physical marker to make a difference on our own. The Spirit makes the difference. Yes, you, worship in or you got something to say. <laughs> Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Absolutely. Listen, this, this is, that's exactly what Paul's trying to say here as well, is there, there is an obvious distinction between someone who is trying to live their life under the law, an impossible system, and someone who is free under grace. There's liberty. Why is it that someone who is under grace can seem so much more happy in what they're doing and in what they're trying to do than someone who's living under the law? Well, because it's freedom versus bondage. Who's going to be thrilled at the prospect of living under bondage? Nobody. Nobody. There should be a distinction. And it's empowered by the Spirit. Nothing here should satisfy us. 
Nothing here should satisfy us. We're designed for a different reality, a different existence as Christians, as those who have been bought by the blood of Christ, who live under, under grace. Nothing here should satisfy us. Now listen, there are beautiful things in this world that God's created for us. My wife and I took a ride yesterday. We'd never been up there. We thought, you know what, we don't have the kids. We're going to go for a ride. We went for a ride up to Port Austin yesterday and uh, just drove her along the lake shore and got to go on a couple little hikes and things up to the lake and, and along the beach there. And what a gorgeous, gorgeous thing to be able to appreciate what God's created for us here. And at one point, I just looked at my wife. I said, I love my state. I love the state of Michigan. I don't like the way that it's going in many ways, obviously, but the, this, the physical state of Michigan is so beautiful. We get to enjoy this, but you know what? As much as we enjoy this, this isn't where I want my eternity to be. <laughs> I love Lake Huron. There is something, about, you know, I've, I've been to the other Great Lakes and all that, and I love Lake Huron. I just love it. This is not where I want to spend my eternity. I mean, why? Because this isn't where I belong. I belong with Christ. I'm a citizen of heaven, not of this world. But until we can reach our home in heaven, we have something that those that live under the law don't have, and that is we have the Spirit who gives us strength for the journey, who gives us a little bit of a taste of the satisfaction that we'll have in glory. See, that's why people don't understand People who are unsaved cannot understand why it is the Christian can smile through tragedy. Why is it that a Christian can smile through loss and pain and suffering? They don't understand that because they don't know the glimpse, just the little glimpse of glory that we've gotten through having the Holy Spirit's indwelling. And it's just a little bit. Now, if, we can, if that little bit can give us enough grace to get through the difficult parts of life, can you imagine what heaven's going to be like? I sat there with, with Rose a few days before she passed, and I was blessed to be able to see her and for her to... I don't, I'm, I'm saying she recognized me, okay? She looked at me, and at one point I, I told her, Rose, we sure love you, and she said, I love you. And that was special to me. It was a precious moment there. But at one point I said, Rose, I'm jealous. I'm jealous because this isn't where I just want to be. I love all my people here, but I can't wait to get to heaven because this isn't where we belong. There's a longing for heaven. There's a homesickness for a place we've never seen because we've got just a glimpse of it here through the Holy Spirit. And he gives us strength for the journey. He gives us that taste of satisfaction that we'll one day have in glory. And when we long for something more than what this world can give us, it's the Spirit that's focusing that desire on God himself. When we long for that, so often Christians who try to live their life on their own apart from the Spirit of God, they're trying to fill that longing for something more than what this world has, but they try to fill it with what this world has. And it never is satisfied. You can never satisfy that spiritual craving with worldliness <laughs> and worldly living. But they, we try, don't we? Maybe this toy or this truck or this house or, you know, whatever, this besetting sin... <laughs> Maybe this will work this time. I'm sure if it's just a little bit more, and we see that in the physical world around us too, you ask, uh, uh, who was it? Was it uh, Warren Buffett or, or Bill Gates? Or I can't remember who it was. Somebody asked them, how much more will make you happy? And they said, one more dollar. Just one more. Oh, I'll find it in one... Just, no, you're never going to find it. You're pursuing something spiritual and you're trying to fill it with something physical, you're never going to find it. And that's the difference between 
law living and faith living. Faith living, we get that glimpse of it, but we know what's coming. And it, the, the more we long for it, the more we desire, and, and we can fill those desires with our relationship with Christ. And the Spirit will focus that desire toward our relationship with God. And next week we'll look at our waiting in expectation. <laughs> waiting in expectation. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad we live with a blessed hope? Aren't you glad that we don't have to live like those that have no hope? No, we have a hope. And we're going to talk a little bit about it next week and uh, talk about that expectation of, of righteousness and uh, what a blessing that is. Talk about, uh, talk about some encouraging words to know that someday I'll be clothed in His righteousness. And I don't have to do it on my own. <laughs> That's an awesome, awesome thing to consider. Lord, we're grateful for Your love and for Your goodness to us this morning. We thank You once again for Your grace. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to live every moment by faith, Lord, and in your grace, walking with the Spirit, or that you'd fill us with your Spirit, more that it wouldn't be about the vessel that the Spirit's in, but rather the Spirit would shine through and would overflow, and Lord, we would help to fill others around us. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.